What you're really asking is, how did you get the product right? If you don't know what the product should do, just ask your user. If you become a billion dollar company, you'd be amazed how quickly your former consultants show up claiming pieces of the technology you thought you bought and paid for. Welcome back to the Squaring the Circle podcast. This is part two of the Entrepreneurial Tech Trailblazing series featuring Bob Butler. In this episode, let's figure out how to get the product right. Bob reveals the entrepreneurial life cycle of a tech company, what it takes from start to finish, getting to the bottom of this query by studying a real and personal case study, growing a good idea into something tangible, cultivating useful technology to grow market need, and turning into a successful business with a lucrative exit. It's time to tune in to what it takes to be a successful tech entrepreneur. Let's dive in. So like, I want to kind of jump into uh, 10 meters one more time and a little bit deeper, if you allow this. And uh, I'm just from my practical experience, I've been in many business meetings about innovation, but now trying to envision me in your place, Bob, working with attorneys. First of all, they are ultra conservative type of users. From the technology point of view, probably not savvy not a technology oriented every now, real, real attorneys don't use computers don't use computers uh, of course now the the absolute techies like crazy uh, but at the time yeah, yeah at the time right we are talking like say probably the time when amazon just started right B- before the internet was really widespread but computers were out and nobody was using them for anything but the email or computer games they were considered like a toy Here's a daunting task to put multiple different um, users in this category into the system. I'm sure everybody had their own custom business rules. Nobody ran the business the same way. And you have to kind of convince them to be in the framework and why it's good for them. Maybe you can dive a little bit deeper into what went right, what went wrong, anything you want to tell about that. The most interesting part of that question is what you're really asking is how did you get the product right? You know, mm-hmm. how did you create something that the attorney said, oh, I need that. So even though many people look at that question as a marketing and messaging problem, it's really an execution problem. Did you get the product right? If you got the product right, there's just not a lot you have to do to get people to adapt it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what really typically happens is the product's not quite right. So now you have to convince people they need it. Now, there are exceptions. There are there are cases where you're creating something so new, people don't know they need it yet. Um, and that's actually a, a completely different scenario. Mm-hmm. But in most cases, it's a it's an innovation rather than an invention. You're improving on something. It's the old better mousetrap. And so if you're going to answer this question, you've got to kind of first decide have you totally invented something new that people don't even know what it is, which I, it, it's, in my case is what I was doing with Time Matters? Um, or are you doing an innovation instead of an invention where you're making something better and you have to you know, convince people it's worth the effort to make the upgrade? Because each one of those are very different uh, mm-hmm. in how you approach it. And if it's an innovation and you find yourself worrying about marketing or having trouble uh, convincing people that it's worth the effort, then you've got the product wrong. Um, And and that's where you have to focus. And that's why I keep circling back around to uh, execution because there's a reason you get the product wrong. And one of it is you don't know what right is, which I'll talk about. But Mm. the other problem is you can't afford to get it right. Your engineers are so expensive or you're giving them so many stock options to get the job done that you're diluting your equity. I mean, there's just there's a lot of problems where you don't really have the talent on board and resourced and managing them in a way that they're producing the product you need to produce. And, And that's one set of problems. I saw that problem by hiring people like Tisby. You know, for me, it's pretty easy because I've been around long enough that I find companies that can always deliver a product I want at a very affordable price and a good timeline. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had a lot of trouble with that part of it, but I would say most troubled ventures, that's where their problem lies. They're, They're paying too much money to get the product built 
So they're cutting corners and the product isn't the product it needs to be. But the other side of that, which is, which is really interesting to me and where even I struggle, is you think you know what the customer wants. I mean, mm -hmm. I invented practice management and I would come up with a feature and I'd call up a lawyer. I said, look, I just invented all pride, excited. And they'd say, man, I don't see where I need that. I said, oh, you, you got to, it's, it's incredible. No, but if you did this, it, it'd be really nice. And I go, oh my God, that's so much better than my idea. And you got to understand this was in a area a business that I created. Mm -hmm. And constantly, I was just upstaged by my customers. We have and similar I, experience here, right? We always say that if you don't know what the product should do, just ask your user. They yeah. On different levels, especially if there, you have different users' levels in the company, say, the, uh, in your situation, it would be very one story you get from the attorney and or the head uh, of the office, very different from the paralegal. Yeah, and the, and the situation I would I would find myself in again and again, we on our own would create great features that just landed like a lead balloon, as they say. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but instead <laughs> of trying to market our way out of our hubris, um, we just adopted a policy. Number one, we, we started using our own products. For, you yeah. know, we, adapt, we actually use Time Matters as our sales funnel CRM and and, and and that was a game changer for us. Uh, Cisco used to have a, a a phrase about that, you know, and I won't repeat it because it's a little crude, but it's, you know, use your own products in-house. And, and in the early days when they were an amazing, innovative company, that was one of yeah. their differentiators. Yeah. And and so if, you, if you're in a situation where you can actually depend on your own products, that's really helpful. Yeah. Hopefully that if you cannot use your own product for your own, that tells a story too, right? Yeah, well, and if you arrange flowers, though, there's only so many flowers you can have in your house. So it's not it's not the best solution. The best solution is to have a launch customer. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I tell every entrepreneur. You know, they, they tell me the great idea. You know, I'd sit in, in our meetings at the, at the accelerator with these fabulously smart people with great ideas. And I'd say, well, who's your launch customer? And it's like, well, what is that? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to make this thing and we're going to, put a great tagline and a great logo and great marketing. And we're going to go find lots of customers. And I said, well, that will work. The only problem is the product will be wrong. It will mm -hmm. be that product that you have to market because it isn't obvious to them what's the need. So I came away from my own very slow to learn experiences that you cannot develop a product without, a, without being in the market with yeah. real customers that yeah. are really using it, that are really depending on it, not just advising or on your committee. Mm -hmm. They got to be using your product every day. And, you know, the way, and I, and I learned a little sort of corollary to this after I had my exit, it was a dream. You know, I, I had all this money and so I could just hire people and build really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, this was an entrepreneur's dream. And so I started another company and built a really cool product. and product wasn't really what it needed to be because despite having all the money and all the experience and all the talent, you know, I took my best people from former ventures. I still didn't have that launch customer. And so we didn't get the product right. And I really learned a lesson. Mm -hmm. And I learned another lesson that's really interesting uh, that I have yet to see any YouTube experts talk about. But not only do you get the product wrong, you can only motivate a team with promises of great wealth and excitement and stock options for about two years. I think I have pretty good relationships with talented people and understand their needs and, and certainly and generous with sharing the rewards of the effort. Um, but if, you, if you're not all working to satisfy a customer, you just can't hold the team together that long. Yeah. I think that's why year two is so catastrophic for so many of these companies mm -hmm. that that really are building an idea. You know, they laugh and say the, the worst, the biggest lines in, in entrepreneurship is build it and they will come. Yeah. Um, build it, no, they're not gonna come. Well, and I think the best example of where this goes wrong even now is is the recent failure of Envision. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Figma and Envision were two great products. They're, you know, important to design and development. They did a good job. And, you know, Figma's in the trenches every day, keeping customers happy. And, 
and Envision is, you know, spending hundreds of millions of dollars with a billion dollar net worth, but the product just wasn't getting better. And, and, and they literally shut down this year with hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank and just kind of nobody using it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we can point to even major consequences in the recent time of this failure to understand the value, not only from getting the product right, but also in motivating your team and, and keeping your ability to improve products together that all depend on it being done strictly in the context of real customers really using your product. I wanted to um, go back really quick to the launch customer. How would you advise our audience to go about finding the right one for their business? Well, it's really pretty easy because most of most people just, you know, they're busy too, right? You know, and a launch customer is a special thing. You make a deal with them, you know, you will make it, they will have influence on a product, which is very appealing because they, every business does things a little different. So great to have the product designed around your way of doing things. So that that's a real incentive. And, um, and you make a deal with them, you I'm going to give you a little bit better price, mm -hmm. uh, make sure you get an agreement about keeping the rights <laughs> all to yourself. Um, but um, which is another thing I like about Tisby, you know, so many companies who do what Tisby do, try to keep it unclear who owns the technology. And I've never seen a company whose agreements just say, no, baby, it's yours. No. Disney's got nothing to do with it. Shameful to admit for the whole industry. Yeah. If you become a billion dollar company, you'd be amazed how quickly your former consultants show up claiming pieces of the technology you thought you bought and paid for. Um, yeah. And this is again, where the, your experience at what customers need to execute is you don't need those problems. You, right. you're, you do work for hire and when you're done, you get paid and you, you know, you move on and mm -hmm. you make it very clear in your agreements that you don't claim any rights to anything that happens with your work. Mm -hmm. And the way you guys operate, that's just good, normal business. But I can tell you, it's actually, you probably don't know this because you don't see the world from my perspective, mm -hmm. but my biggest problem in hiring other firms to do work is they either are mute on the subject, they say nothing about it, mm -hmm. or they have these phrases that can real subject to interpretation, mm -hmm. which is a fancy way of saying big legal bill someday. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's the kind of execution errors you don't want to make. Mm -hmm. um, but back to Lily's question, um, you, you, you do identify this special customer. But it, it, there's a quid pro quo. You, you give them a product more attuned to their way of doing business. You give them a special deal and and you build a good relationship with them. And so launch customers, they're not impossible to find, but you know, you have to cultivate a different kind of relationship with them. And and if you can't find one, don't do it. I mean, it, I, it just kind of comes down to uh, you can probably get by but with very little money. And you can probably get by with, you know, not having a lot of the capabilities to get things done on staff, but you're not going to get by without a good launch customer. You, yeah. you, you will build a company. You'll feel good for a year or two that you're an entrepreneur and you'll burn through friends, family, or some VC's money. Uh, but you're not going to get the result that you want. Me, I ask you just to finalize the time matters and Lexus Nexus to talk a little bit about your exit because many entrepreneurs would dream about what you have done and it was in the older days right when it was less popular like oh look, look uh a, you you started up this uh practice management company essentially time accounting company for for the narrow market and then all of a sudden lexus nexus is at your door and all of a sudden you exit and tell us more how did you do it what happened after that well, it, it was a real experience. And, and frankly, if anyone's advising you, make sure they have an exit under their belt uh, because it's one of those bizarro worlds where nothing really is as it appears to be. <laughs> I mean, it usually begins like it began with me is, hello, we'd like to buy your company. Oh, uh, well, really, it's not for sale. I'm very happy, thank you. Okay, then we'll buy your competitor, put millions of dollars in them and put you out of business. Thank you very much. So. 
it's not always as much under your control as you think. So that was the first real surprise for me when, when, when they came calling. And of course, it's all very friendly and diplomatic and legal, but the message comes through. Um, but the probably the most valuable thing I can tell an entrepreneur today is what I'm about to say. I, I think the thing that mostly surprised me about the exit is the, the idea that due diligence and the price, they, they used to call it letter of intent. Now they have some legal problems, they call it letter of interest. But they send you a letter and says, we're going to pay you X millions of dollars for your company. And there's this whole strategy. The minute you get that letter, the, the phrase they use is you get dollar signs in your eyes and you start, you know, visualizing the car and the pool with the kids around the pool. And, you know, this whole dollar sign in your eye thing comes over your brain and you start being really stupid. Um, and the thing about the letter of intent, the LOIs, is most entrepreneurs only see a small portion of that number. Mm -hmm. And this was the biggest surprise to me. Um, I've probably seen 50 LOIs, and I only know of one LOI where the price paid on closing was the same as the LOI price. Mm -hmm. And this was mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, I had the good fortune of having some early advice that uh, basically the way the game is played, you you get your price, you get all start, you know, dollar signs in your eyes, and then they do what they call due diligence. And you think due diligence is to make sure you're not a fraud. But what you don't realize is if they had any, they've already checked you out before they offered the LOI. So there's no concern about fraud. The whole purpose of due diligence is to renegotiate the price. Reduce your buying tag, right? Correct. So they're, they're going to basically say, well, you know, we were concerned that you didn't pay your sales tax in California. Or there'll probably be a lawsuit. You know, mm -hmm. we got to take $5 million off the price just to hedge our risk. And, you know, I hear New Jersey, uh, you know, you went to a conference there. Did you stay more than five days? Well, that, that makes you qualified for sales tax. You didn't pay with penalties and interest. We have another $2 million exposure here. So pretty much most deals close at between 40 and 50% of the LOI price. Mm -hmm. And entrepreneurs get it really infuriates me because they just get taken day in, day out with this, this little procedure. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the M&A guys at these companies often are incentivized in their annual bonuses by how much they can close below the Those LOI. Are, yeah. now, I'll give you some advice. If you plan on working long term at the company that acquires you, be prepared to be really unliked by the M&A guys if they don't get their bonuses because you hang on for the LOI price. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic uh, once, once you're acquired. The, the answer is, you know, you just have to have advisors that understand the game, people have experience, and you have to decide, you know, what is your price and can you walk away? Mm -hmm. And the other thing the due diligence does is it distracts you from your job. You're, you're busy now dealing with all these inquiries you know, show me every license agreement for every piece of software you ever bought. And you're like, oh, well, OK. And you're busy doing that. While you're doing that, you're not managing the business. So the business starts to suffer. And you get to this point where you, you know, business is looking bad because you haven't been paying attention for six months of due diligence. And you suddenly say, well, you know, five dollars is still better than nothing. And so, you know, 10 was good. I'll take five and let's, let's move forward. And that whole gamesmanship is institutionalized. It, it's part of the whole process. So the culture of acquiring. Yeah, business. you, you okay. really just don't want to go into an exit without somebody in the room that's mm -hmm. been in an exit. Totally. You know, that just that's just the bottom line of my story that I would share. In this situation, how did you handle negotiation? Do you have any tips? Well, again, yes, yeah, so it's a very complicated process. And, and you know, I have a, a saying I say to authors all the time. Don't do crime. Don't break the law because you're only breaking the law like once or twice in your lifetime. But the people coming to get you, they're trying to catch you all day, every day. And, and, and no matter how smart you are, no matter how clever you are, while they will take a long time, they will get you because that's what they do all day. And it's the same with M&A. The M&A team is all day, every day, figuring out how to get this company on a better term. And, and no matter how smart you are, 
and how good your lawyers are and your team is, you're just tremendously disadvantaged because you're not in the business of going through mergers and acquisitions. I think you just have to really respect that you are in a different world now. Money is not going to fix it, and you could be really disadvantaged. There are lawyers that are a lot better than others. You know, there are law firms in Raleigh, Durham. It's hard to beat Wyrick Robbins, for example. I mean, they just so specialized mm -hmm. in deals, and they, they're just so protective of the entrepreneurs. But they help you get the deal done too. You know, they're not obstructionists, but they're protective. Other than you know, mentioning a few professionals that are good at this. But you want to be surrounded by other people. You know, this is not the place to be the solo superstar entrepreneur. This is the place to have a room full of really talented people. Yeah, they're charging you $400 an hour. And yeah, you're getting these big bills that's, that you've never seen anything like before. I think the two places I like to spend money on talented professionals is, you know, doctors and lawyers. <laughs> you know? Yes, and, for sure. And, 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 and there's a lot of litigators out there and some better than others. Um, but you, you probably are going to get a good litigator if somebody's suing you or you're suing them. But only a few what we call transactional lawyers are really good at helping entrepreneurs get through uh, their exit in reasonably good shape. Thanks for tuning in and keep an eye out for part three coming out. The discussion will include how modern technologies like AI affect the entrepreneurial climate, as well as competing pricing models. Which systems benefit the entrepreneur versus which ones benefit the customer. Thanks again and be sure to subscribe to our Spotify and follow our social media accounts for regular updates on the Swearing the Circle podcast.